the school is ultimately responsible for a child's physical and mental safety and good environment while the child is in the premises of the school. Hello and welcome to Special Moms Africa, the podcast. Real talk on special needs parenting. My name is Bukola Ayinde and I'm your lead host on today's episode. But I'm not doing this on my own. I am in the studio with my fellow special mom, Tonye Falugi A.K.Z. A.K.Z. <laughs> and today's topic is hot. One had to look at the issue regarding duty of care and regulation of educational institutions. Hmm. So, many of our listeners will know about the shocking and painful death of Sylvester Oromoni, a student at Doen College, allegedly brutalized while under the care of the school. Also making rounds is the story of a special needs school that is using forced restraints and electroshock treatment on its students. These are just two incidents. Now, before we get stuck into the show, allow me to introduce our guest. Kunle Lawal. Mm. He is an entrepreneur, idea generator, politician, <laughs> TEDx speaker, and patriot. Mm-hmm. He has a keen eye for opportunities based on his experience in the politics, working with non-governmental organizations and the federal government. He is passionate about Nigeria and is what can be termed a detribalized Nigerian. He considers his boundaries to be limitless and is really focused on changing the Nigerian narrative in political participation. And it's with this tenacity he currently serves as the executive director of the Electoral College Nigeria. We're happy to meet you. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, thank you. (laughs) Okay. Tell us quickly what you do and why. Okay, it's kind of easy to say what I do. The problem is the why. So, <laughs> so I'll start with um, I'm the executive director of the Electoral College Nigeria. We're a very focused pioneer political literacy institution in this country. We're very focused on educating people politically because you can't engage something you don't understand. And that's where we spend a lot of our time. We've trained over 8,000 students presently. In our two years of inception, um, we've also helped uh, push the bar a little bit with um, interaction with political parties, upgrading their general thought process and how they operate. We also have decided to put our medal a little bit with debates because we, if we uplift the quality of debates, we also will uplift what the candidates are offering and what the electorate too can request from um, candidates that are intending to participate and we've pushed the only virtual debate held at senatorial level in Africa and that was the Lagos East by elections. We also have a handbook also coming out for kids between ages 12 and 26 on politics generally and we try to make it a little different, you know, try to make politics look a little bit, if I can't use the word sexy. <laughs> so, um, Fantastic. So the why, which is always the part I really can't answer. Let me put it simply, and I don't want to say the electoral college is fully about me, so I'm going to I'm going to try and make it simple. So, what I think the why is is I'm always scared. I have five year old son, and I'm always scared that um, if Ni- if something happens to Nigeria, he's going to ask me because very intelligent. He's going to ask me, Daddy, when Nigeria was going bad, what was your input? And I'm afraid of that, and I think that's the why. I think that's an amazing why. Hmm. When you said you're not sure about the why, I think you're very sure about the why. <laughs> Okay, so today we have two guests in the studio. I was bringing back a very, very important guest who was in episode four. That is Helen Obiageli Oshikoya, founder of... Hello. (laughs) Hey. (laughs) She is the founder of Nobel... Nobel... Nobelova Nobelova Gradani. Noble citizens. Oh, pardon me, madam. (laughs) You know, psychoeducational services... We met her back in episode four, and she's going to talk, you know, on um, duty of care. Concerning this topic that we're saying today, right, 
Madam, tell us more about the duty of care of schools and institutions. Well, hi everybody. Thank you for having me back. So at this point in time, I'll be wearing the cap of a legal practitioner. And the truth of the matter is that the duty of care goes beyond the day-to-day functioning of a school. The duty of care is that the school is ultimately responsible for a child's physical and mental safety and good environment while the child is in the premises of the school. So basically everything that happens to the child, even though it might not be the school itself that actually committed whatever the offense is, there is a vicarious liability that the school has. And because of that vicarious liability, they cannot say that they are not responsible for whatever happens in their premises. So all those things are when a child is on the premises. So if something does happen, what is the usual protocols? You know, because, for example, with um, Sylvester's case, you know, what you hear is that, you know, the, the school uh, communicated that it was a football injury. Yes. Um, and they just sent him to the school nurse. They didn't, I guess, escalate it to the point of taking him to the doctor. So in the schools my children are in, for example, you sign paperwork at the big start of each term mm-hmm. and on there you list your pediatrician for the child. If there's an emergency, are you willing for them to send them to the doctor or give them medicine, etc., etc.? You have these things which you sign. So, so with that situation... You know, I wonder why didn't they take it to the doctor? Hospital. Yeah, to a proper hospital, knowing that his parents are out of state parents. Far away. Yeah. Okay, so let me take it from the angle of one, the nurse that attended to him, is she a licensed nurse or is she an auxiliary nurse? Mm-hmm. Because if she was a licensed nurse, she would have been able to examine him to the extent that she will be of the professional opinion that the child needs to have proper hospital care. So you have to really start with that point. Mm -hmm. And then the second point is that at the time when the parents actually informed them that he had, you know, had a football mishap or football game mishap, if you tell me that my son got injured in football, (laughs) I will say, okay, don't worry. I'll get somebody to come. Is it okay if I come tomorrow? And the school mm-hmm. says, yes, you can come tomorrow. I would not have it in my mind that my child is near death mm-hmm. if they tell me exactly. that it is a football. Mm-hmm. If they tell me, oh, madam, he's, he had a football, you know, he played football, but we have the opinion that he's, um, it's a little bit of an emergency. Can you come down? It depends on how it was narrated to the parents. So the parents are in Port Harcourt, yeah. you know, and... Yep. Trusting that their child is in good care. And then the school themselves, do they even know what even happened to the boy before they even sent the information to the parents? So that then who t- told them yes. it was a football, who told them it was a football incident? Did they go and ask the coach? Did the coach say Sylvester was playing football? So you have to ask to find out what was the investigative process that they even did to come to the conclusion to say that it was even a football accident. So it's about, obviously, the rigour and how thorough people, you know, the schools themselves are at that point in time to even go into that much detail. And that should really be part of the protocol. Yeah. Yes, it seems to me that they don't have any protocol. What should happen is that immediately it happens, an incident report should have been written by the coach mm-hmm. by the by the uh, nurse the coach will say this is uh, or were they playing football and the coach was somewhere else or were they playing who's supervising them mm-hmm. you see the problem is we are not seeing the role of supervision in this young man's case nobody seems to be supervising these children how can a gang of children leave their hostel walk upstairs to Mm. another hostel to beat a child and nobody saw anything. Anything. So I would want to say here from all that you have said, I think the school was more about covering their backs than following the procedure of protecting the child's life. 
it was more important for them no... to protect their name, you know, and cover up some things, you know, mm. instead of following some so, procedures. So, well, since from the... my own point of view, if no matter how incompetent a school is, yes. they must have protocols. I am of the opinion that they actually do not have any protocols. Can you give us some example of what this protocol should entail? Okay, like as I practical said, practical steps that the school should take when take, an incident okay, occurs then happens. Yes. Okay, I will only look from my own point of my own organization because we do have children under our care. Yes. What happens is that if something happens to a child, right, no matter how minor. Even to the extent that if a child comes to us and there are injuries on the child, we will narrate it. So we do inspection. Any child that comes to us in the morning, we do physical inspection to make sure that there's no injuries from home or anything. And we make note of it in our book. If something happens while the child is in our care, right, they will inform the HR. HR will tell them to write an incident report. The incident report will be escalated to the superintendent. And if we're of the opinion that the parent needs to be informed in an emergency, the parents will be contacted immediately. If it is a minor incident, maybe she, the child poured, uh, maybe, I can give an instance, maybe the child hit another child when they were playing. Mm -hmm. So that's just a play thing. It will be narrated. But it wouldn't be escalated to an emergency. It would be in the daily then report. If so, yes, in the daily report. Then if it is an emergency, the parent will be called immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, let me tell you, I have an instance where a child, I think she had a seizure. Yes, she had a seizure. And we had to rush the child to the hospital, in the nearest hospital close to us. We called the mom. And the mom said, oh, that's fine. I will come and get her after work. And we're like, but madam, she is in the hospital. It's not that she is in the school. She's in the hospital. If I'm told my child is in the hospital, wild horses cannot keep me mm -hmm. before I get to that place. I give an instance. I was going to Abuja two months ago. The school called me and we're like, oh, ma, your son. Yeah. The only thing I asked them, I said, is my son alive? And they said, oh, ma, it's not like that he's alive. I said, okay, please call the father. I'm on a plane. I'm going to Abuja. If they had made the mistake and telling me, you need to come in there, so, 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 it's an emergency. You mm -hmm. need to come there. If the plane is tasking, mm -hmm. I will go and almost kill the pilot. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's expected. Okay, so let me quickly go to yes. Kule here. So, Kule... What laws are currently in place to protect students and those within the educational system in Nigeria? Well, first, I must say the first problem in Nigeria is that um, laws exist, but people do not implement them. Mm. So it's clear that beyond reasonable doubt, that even I think within Lagos legalities, within Lagos State House of Assembly, as a child is, of course, an act in Child's Rights Act, which is, of course, enforced in Lagos State. Lagos has accepted and, you know, has bylaws and stuff. The problem is now, first and foremost, how ambiguous is the law? So uh, you have a situation where it says protect the rights of the child and doesn't say anything else. So you what have a, you, uh, which rights does it actually refer to? Which right is it actually talking about? Which right is it making a position to? And you have those situations and it, it tends to say, and you know, this can be argued in court as usual. You know, lawyers are smart. Oh, yeah, we are but, smart. Uh, yeah, no. I mean, we are smart. They are not that smart, come on. <laughs> so back to what I was saying. So they, of course, have those loopholes. And, you know, they have to say, okay, this does not cover this. And under jurisdictions, they can prove to it, beyond reasonable doubt that this was not actually mentioned. And, you know, I think these loopholes in law are created because of poor legislation and the kind of people we have helping legislate and the level of legislation we have. So the problem, we have two problems in Nigeria. First one being laws not being critically clear on what rights are and what rights cannot be trampled on or trifled with by, you know, the public. Second would be the fact that those even existent laws are not implemented. I would say something. What I think affects regulation of schools the most is that, okay, in the situation where you have public schools actually being adaptable to government laws, Private schools are kind of on a free fall. Mm -hmm. And as I've seen in Lagos, they actually, okay, because 
I don't want to say it, We're but following the British say curriculum. No, say I don't, I don't, I don't want. I, 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 I've, I've lived, it. I've lived in Abuja for 21 years, and I was, I was also born and raised in um, northern Nigeria, which would be Zaria, to be precise, Kaduna State. And I schooled in Jos to which is Plateau State, which means I have a clear thought process of how private schools and public schools function in northern Nigeria. But in Lagos, I think I've never seen any. It's uh, a free yeah, it's, I've Let's never seen any. any say, I've yeah, never, I've never seen any rush for cash. I think the only difference between them and the mafia, are the fact that they don't yeah. carry guns, <laughs> yeah. and, and you know, the Lagos private school system, of course, dictates how it's going to be, dictates anything, taking your kids or whatever. And you know, I think it's also built up around the elitist thought process of mm-hmm. Lagosians who think, you know, my child is doing this, and we have this particular school we're going to. So it's hard to enforce such laws if you're within. And we also understand the Nigerian problem of, uh, you know, when you know a few people in government, mm-hmm. you're also untouchable. So these are massive problems that, you know, tend to trample on the rights of the child without, you know, not saying that there are non-existent laws or there aren't a government agency to deal with that. Now, you wonder in this situation with Darwin, where the hell is the Nigerian mm-hmm. Human Rights Commission? Mm-hmm. Because it's within it's their a purview. Human rights commission. Yeah, yeah, it's within their issue. purview to handle mm-hmm. children's rights. But um, I'm sure the DG is somewhere in Abuja trying to get another bulletproof land cruiser. So, hey. uh, back to everything hmm. that we're going to be discussing. So, yes, these are issues that we, of course, have to face. And I would say two people are to blame for this. One, I think the kind of laws the Lagos State House of Assembly mm-hmm. has put out for effective um, child for child rights in Lagos and um, the National Assembly too who's been of course doing nothing but getting rich of consultancy projects and I All think generally yeah. generally parents I think who also have you know I'd cite an example you know when this do anything happened I said something and I said it's a whole failure in the, an entire system so I remember while growing up I remember then if you jump the fence I'm not saying I jump the fence okay I'm saying you I jump the fence because you can't, you can't beat me for it now. <laughs> it's, it's committed a long time ago. So if you jump on wearing your uniform, any adult that passed would ask you, what are you doing outside? Mm-hmm. Not anymore. And, no, mm-hmm. those things don't happen again. Yeah. So as much as we would like to point fingers at the school, I think we should necessarily point mm-hmm. fingers at ourselves. Mm-hmm. The system entirely has broken down. And the situation that happened there is just a reflection of what we do at our political circles, our mm-hmm. job circles, and whatever, and just just a reflection. Children just reflect what exactly we yeah. adults do. So we're not having killer kids. Yes. So, yeah. so it's frightening. I, I, it's really frightening. And I think both Helen and Kunle have spoken really well on on it. And I and I just want to say, in terms of both um, Sylvester's murder and the case of the school essentially mistreating and abusing the special needs children. We see this, right? I don't have a child at Doing College. I don't have a child in that school, but it could be any one of our yeah, children. Yeah, exactly. So what, as a parent, what, as a citizen, can we do? I don't have to wait for a parent to get up and say, this happened, when I know it happens. <coughs> Is there something, as a citizen, in the law that we could do to say, perhaps, sue the school, even if our children do not go to those particular schools? Yeah, you actually were, right, because according to the Child Rights Act, you actually have the privilege to hold, uh, when a right of a child is being infringed on, you have a right to act. But we'll now come down to, even as a country, how Nigeria even looks at it. I think that the value of a Nigerian life right now is somewhere between 75 Kobo and 50. And Ew, if you, so this, sad. this, this states, this clearly states, and I'll give an example. There was something that happened, I can't tell where, I think it was judo or somewhere yesterday. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we'll where a student, uh, a trailer ran into a school bus or something and killed, killed some 20, children. And the children were, children. the children demonstrated and the next thing the police went trigger happy. Mm-hmm. Really? So you can't expect a country who has decided to eat its future to have a future. Wow. So that for me, that's where everything just seems to get really, really, really messed up. So yes, as a citizen, can you ha- actually hold it? Yes, you have. You have the channels. You have everything. But in the end, we're going to start to say, okay, he's my friend. This one's a celebrity. Yeah. This one's known to close to the governor. And once it's close to the governor, nothing's going to get done. And that's where mm. that situation we find ourselves. So how do we, Helen? Yeah. You know, um, just to reinforce what my learned colleague said. There's another situation that happened at a school in Abeokuta where a girl was gang raped by 13 of her male 
colleagues, oh, wow. of male students. Yeah, yes. And she protested and she spoke. And obviously they covered it up. So what they did was that there's a boy who is close to the owner of the school. They indicted the boy and said the boy was there. And because of that, the whole incident was um, pushed under, was, was swept under the rug. The girl has come back 17 years later saying that, no, she's not going to let it go, that she demands a public apology. She demands, or she made her demands quite clear. She's grown up now. The girl's wow. grown up. Wow. But you see, what I feel, what, what kind of upset me in the whole situation is that hmm. I don't see why anybody should be ashamed to say they were defiled. Mm-hmm. Or raped or molested. It's an African or thing. It's not just an African I thing. I know, <laughs> but the, it's an African thing. But you see, we have to understand that mental health, the anguish and the psychological pain that that victim goes through is not peculiar to Africa. Hmm. So if, if, is so something, if, if a teacher, or a staff member mm-hmm. wants to say something. If a student wants to say something, if a parent wants to say something, a concerned citizen wants to say something, what can be done? What are actual steps you can, you can take? You can start a pe- you can start a petition. You can mm-hmm. start a petition. So Kunle, how petition? do we start a petition? Okay, of course I think for me if you're going to start a petition, I think you should first um um petition the the, um, of course, National Human Rights Commission, who directly is in charge of, you know, such situations. And after doing that, you should petition the National Assembly for not making the adequate laws. You see, the problem that we always have in Nigeria is that we emotionally deal with the matter at hand, and then we forget other pending we situations forget. at the back. Do you understand? So in the end, we are just shouting, "Oh, okay." Then they give you restitution for this particular case. Mm. Then we all yes. go to sleep, abandoning the entire system Everybody that is actually is broken down. You understand? Everything. So nobody is looking okay. at well, the fact that it's all, now it's shocking that special needs kids who are still treated yeah. in Nigeria like I don't even want to know because I I have the feeling that. But th- let me just be honest. Uh, I apologize. I'm normally brutally honest, but I know pets in Nigeria that are treated better than. Children you, with you don't special have to needs. apologize for that statement. We it's know that, it's that's the truth. I've seen this happen, and I've seen this across board. And this is, and we claim it's our African nature of not understanding. That's a fallback. Really? That's, that's really? a fallback excuse. Really? So, in the end, you ask yourself the question: Are we human beings actually mm-hmm. in Africa? And you know the funny thing: we seem to, when it comes to children and co, and then we see their rights, and then we complain. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. What happens in the workplace? What do we tolerate in banks against mm-hmm. uh, women? What do we tolerate against women in politics? I'm a politician. And I'll tell you what I see. I, I can tell you for free. Politics. Let's not forget the younger yeah, men in politics I, too. Can I just jump in here? Yes, you can. You know, my condolence to you know Sylvester and all the other children. You know that this has happened, but we also have forgotten that we still have a notable case of the cheaper girls that still hasn't been addressed. And still hasn't been attended to. There are some girls somewhere who are in captivity and are still not able to see their parents and, you know, be able to live a good life. I remember everything that was trending, chibok, 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 their task, blah, 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 blah. That is almost how many years it's after? Five, five, well, more than five. Five. Yeah. Where are those girls yeah. today? It's it's really so. It's I really think I so think sad. I think we are just you know even will I say to a large extent even myself I say to myself ah oh ah oh and then tomorrow it's back to normal. So hmm. it's time to change. Time we to have to change. Have, we have Impact. to have a conscience. Yes. We have to have we have to have a tender conscience. We have to have a conscience that continues disturbing us when we see things that are uh, not uh, right right exactly so i have to jump in here before because our time is fast spent so could i ask you this question what are the appropriate punishment to be meted out to offenders 
Should they go to prison? Should they go to remand homes? Should they go to psychiatric hospital? What exactly should be done to the, minors? You, you know, the teachers are adults, yeah, to yes. yeah, so they could go to prison if found guilty by a court of law. But the minors in this case, what should be done to them? What is appropriate? You know, for me, let's look at this holistically. So, if this happened to a in another country, the first thing that will happen is the end will probably be prescribed as a school in that country to, to cease to be a school. Mm-hmm. The second thing, because you have to, you must treat such things with a hard hand and not because you don't like someone, but because you don't want to reoccur us. You don't want it to become mm-hmm. the tradition. Mm-hmm. So that will come first. Yes. Second, now, of course, minors cannot be held according to the full length of law, but of course, we have juvenile, laws, juvenile institutions and of course, they should be remanded to that regardless of whose father is what. The problem, the biggest problem in Nigeria is the fact that we we are selective in justice. Mm. Meaning, if I as a vice president, and this has happened in Nigeria, so somewhere along the line, uh, someone on the patrol team of the vice president had an accident and, you know, because of and, and you know, they just um, settled the family or whatever. If it were another country, the vice president will be taken to court hmm. over that particular issue because he's under your jurisdiction and working for you and the country. He died in service. Yes, we understand he died in service, but these are things that matter. So, of course, the minors must be taken remanded. Teachers also that were probably within that should not be allowed to teach again in this mm-hmm. country. Hmm. They must be hard-lined, yeah. clear-cut punishment. Yeah. This is not because you hate anyone. Mm. I'm going to reiterate it. It is because you do not want a reoccurrence of such situations. Mm. And that is why you protect the system. Thank you so much. So, um, finally, Kunle, what is your honest truth? What is that one thing that you've not said somewhere before, but you want the audience to know in just one minute about what we're talking about? Um, you see, I take Nigerians as the most uneducated human beings. Yeah. And, and this is not because... Oh, yeah, oh. This is not because we don't have institutions. We are, very educated, we are not. Mm. So, you see, there's... there's Maybe thing, exposure there's, is what you're no, talking about. No, no, it's not about. exposure, it's education. Wow. You see, it's one thing to understand an exam and pass it. Mm-hmm. And there's one thing to translate what you've learned and then to bring it back to practicalize it. And the problem we have in Nigeria is practicalizing it. So, mm-hmm. And we're so emotional... Ah, NSARS, NSARS, hey, 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 they killed people, police, hey, 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 start shouting, shouting, shouting. Ah, the number of people that came out for NSARS could recall the entire Lagos State House of Assembly. Please tell me why you didn't take that option. Mm-hmm. You get, we're too emotional. And because of that emotion, we do not strategically think. So, mm-hmm. you have to be more so most of the time, we end up making funny decisions. Mm-hmm. Like it's easy to say, ah, I don't have, I don't have light in my transformer. The president, the president is bad. Your local government chairman, when you see him and you're invited to his, to his daughter's wedding, you're taking selfie. He's responsible <laughs> for it now. So I don't understand <laughs> where we selectively don't get it. So okay, we're not educated it's enough. been such a good time talking with you, Kunle. Thank you. So, well, our dear listeners, unfortunately, this is all we can have time for. And I'd like to thank our guests, Helen Obiageli Oshikoye and Kule Lawa Hello. for sharing this <laughs> time with us. So you can find Helen. Helen, what's your handle? Please let uh, listeners know your handle. My email is nobulevergradani at gmail.com. And then you can get us on nobulevergradani, Instagram, Nobulever Loves Me. Great. So Kule, what's yours? On Instagram, I am Kule Lawal on Instagram and then just Kule Lawal on Twitter. All right. So I'd like to thank my co-host, Tonye. And I'm Bukola Ainde. And of course, you can find us on our social media handle, Special Moms Africa. Join us next time on Special Moms Africa, real talk on special needs parenting. Until then, bye. 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 bye.